Howdy everybody, this is Professor Keegan and this is the video lecture for our class for March 31st. Uh, so time is indeed passing, I know it probably feels like it's not, um, but soon we'll be in April and we are moving toward the end of the semester. So I just have some key reminders for you before we get into course content and you'll notice that we're starting a new unit, uh, our very last unit of the class today. So before we get into that, I just want to push some reminders to you. Um, first of all, one, uh, if you're planning on graduating, you actually have to apply to do that. Um, so make sure you're utilizing your major advisor to make sure that this uh, process is complete uh, because we want you to be able to get that degree, right? So um, make sure that you've done that. Secondarily, uh, if you're not graduating and you're planning on taking more courses to complete your degree, um, registration is open for next academic year. Um, there will be quite a rush for seats in, in courses because you can imagine some people have had to drop, drop classes or go credit, no credit. Um, so there's going to be a lot of enrollment pressure. Um, so I would really encourage you to be up on registering for courses. Utilize your advising center, utilize your major and minor advisors um, to make sure that you're getting those courses that you need. Um, for our own course, uh, I am going to be asking for you to make sure that you submit any past due assignments to me by the 14th, which is two weeks away. Um, this is really kind of the last day I can take work from the main body of the course. So that's discussion entries and the keyword and concepts checklist. That's also presentations, facilitation materials. Um, I'm going to need all of those from you um, just so I can turn them around and get them into the grade book. Um, I have noticed some of you do seem to be falling a little bit behind in the schedule. Um, so if that's happening to you because of a barrier or something we can strategize around, I'm going to ask you to just reach out to me and let me know what's going on with you so we can develop a plan to get that work in and make sure that you're getting your credits. Um, however, if you're submitting late work, I would ask that you please just reach out to me. Uh, Blackboard doesn't always alert me about that and I would hate to miss some work that's been put into Blackboard just because I haven't been made aware of it. So please do let me know if you're submitting something past due um, just so I can make sure to go back and, and score it so that you get credit for that work. Now um, we have decided to have our final exam be a prompted essay exam, an open book essay exam. Um, I'm going to be posting those prompts on Blackboard by the end of next week. And I'll definitely let you know when I do that. I'll create an assignment window with this um, in uh, kind of worksheet in it to move you through the prompts. Um, that will be due by the last point in our final exam period, which is scheduled for April 21st on t that Tuesday, the finals week. So um, that will be the due date for this final assignment, uh, which will give you about two weeks to work on it on your own time. Um, so if there is some kind of scheduling conflict where you know that's going to be a problem for you to get work in during that, that window or before it, um, please just let me know, email me, reach out to me. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody can submit work um, and uh, complete the course. So yeah, just stay in touch with me um, and we'll make it work. Okay, so those are just the reminders for today. Um, we are starting our last unit of the semester, which is called stories. So we've, we've moved from place to bodies to stories. And in this unit, we're thinking about how uh, LGBTQ people um, storytell and create narratives about our lives that might be different from how dominant accounts of identity are designed or work. Um, and I'm opening with this image from Edie Fake. Edie Fake is the author of the book we read, Gaylord Phoenix, uh, but Edie Fake is also um, a visual artist, not just a comics illustrator, and this piece is called The Bindery. Um, and we see here how Fake is telling us a story about trans experience um, by showing us this kind of metaphorized body in this piece um, wrapped in this very tight binding. Um, so we start to see how bodies are not just created by what's inside of them, the shape of a body, but also by what's outside of them pressing in. Um, bodies can take up space because of what presses on them. Um, we are shaped by our environments. 
So that relationship between place and body is very much part of this piece. And we think about uh, transmasculine practices of binding, right, of flattening the chest as a kind of practice that's related to gender presentation and a kind of uh, story that's going on underneath people's clothing sometimes, um, a sort of private experience of um, making the body appear a certain way so that a certain story can take place around that body, a story of gender. Um, so fake is really brilliant at using design and pattern and shape to convey queer and trans experience. And we're going to be talking more about this in this, uh, this video. Um, to start off with, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, broad themes in this unit. Um, because in our culture, having a story really equates to being a person. Um, we tell stories in order to maintain, to become and maintain our personhood. Um, to become people, to be considered people in society and in families. Um, sorry, my box is over, over the print here. But um, in Western culture, we really organize life according to a dominant pattern. I'm going to ex exit out of this. That is a core straight pattern. Um, and I say straight because it's a heterosexual pattern, but it's also a pattern that moves, that connects things in a straight line, right? Um, birth, and then adolescence, and then marriage, and then reproduction, and then retirement, and then death, right? This kind of path, this straight path that everyone is supposed to be moving along. Um, and so that's how most stories are organized. If you think about even our narrative media, many of the, the films, television shows, books that we consume order life in this pattern. And um, that's kind of always built in as a story that we're supposed to live up to. Um, it is the normative narrative structure through which we're supposed to form our core relationships, right? So there's a brief amount of time in our adolescence or childhood, um, really only adolescence, where we're free to make friends with people unlike us. Um, but then that very quick, quickly in this kind of straight timeline narrows down into one primary partner in a marriage, right? And then only really um, forming deep relationships with people in our biological family. Friends become less important as uh, supposedly as we age. And we really, at the end of our life, are completely de de dependent on biological connections that we've built with children earlier in our lives. So all of our relationships, except for this momentary period that you kind of were all in as people in your 20s and 30s, right? Um, that's the core relationships all come from these more straight um, uh, sort of patterns. Now, what this means is that being able to tell a recognizable story is how we earn and maintain status as persons who belong culturally and socially. So having a story people can make sense of um, is part of how we become people and how we maintain our relationships to others. Um, throughout our lives. And if we deviate off of this normative narrative path, we start to become less recognizable as people. So the problem is that queer lives often do not conform to this order of events of, of birth, adolescence, marriage, reproduction, and death, right? Um, those are pretty heteronormative and or cisnormative um, ways of thinking about major events in our life history. And so why? Um, because queer people may not get married, may not have children. Um, you could think about trans people may not go through just one adolescence, but possibly two adolescences, right? Especially if they are medically transitioning. Um, going through puberty twice um, is a common experience that can actually feel like it's given you a new youth or slowed your life down or you're doing a, a sort of time travel. Um, so, the main ways in which we storytell and organize stories are structured by these expectations that really reflect straight and cisgender experiences more than queer and trans ones. So that's like the basic framework for this unit on stories. So we think about examples of this, right? Um, there are ways of visually storytelling um, that are all around us. 
And so we could think about, you know, this is Mitt Romney, um, Senator Mitt Romney and his family, and they are really infamous for taking these very elaborately staged photos of their multi-generational family. And we could ask ourselves what kind of story this picture tells, right? Um, what kind of story are the Romneys trying to tell about themselves uh, by arranging their family in these photos? And how is it a straight or cis story that they're telling versus a queer or trans one? We see a story here of generational inheritance, of biological similarity, of gender polarity, uh, of gender binarism, right? Um, where it's very clear uh, who the boys are and who the girls are. Um, it's, it's pretty clear there's a real gender balance here where people are positioned to mirror one another. Um, it's very clear generationally which generation people belong to. Um, and it's very clear that because Romney and his wife are centered that all of these people, uh, people are reflections of them. Um, and so this becomes a way of telling a very straight story about how heterosexuality is a repetition of itself into the future. Um, now imagine uh, being a queer person trying to fit into this picture. Where would you stand? What would you wear? Uh, where would you be positioned? Would there be anyone to mirror you the way that this photo is set up? There's like really no place in this photo for a queer or trans person to take up space. So it's a story uh, that writes out queer and trans experience as a possibility. And um, it's just one of the many ways in which visual iconography can, can re-articulate straight and cisgender norms. So what we're really stop talking about when we think about the dominant narrative ordering of a story, um, and then the way in which queer and trans people are pushed out of, uh, pushed out of the frame by that dominant narrative, are, is this idea of a compulsory account. Now we've talked about compulsory heterosexuality, and this is a related issue. So because the dominant structures of storytelling in our culture are set up for straight and cisgender people, LGBTQ people are often pressed to tell stories about our lives in ways that are less challenging to those structures. So um, we are for, we're kind of forced to explain ourselves in ways that create the least friction with this dominant narrative. Um, and these compulsory, meaning um, necessary or demanded accounts, are often expected from us by straight and cis people. So whether it's family members, um, partners, religious figures, medical providers, teachers, um, people who control access to resources, um, people, those people often expect us to explain ourselves or give an account of why we are the way we are, um, uh, to kind of like justify ourselves, to make them more comfortable with us and our difference. Um, and so you'll, you'll start to notice that we're constantly kind of navigating this expectation to make other people more comfortable and less challenged by our presence. And we tell stories to make people comfortable about us. Um, and so following one of our early readings, Sarah Schulman's, um, homophobia as a pleasure system, we could say that these compulsory accounts are part of the pleasure system by which straight and cis people uh, maintain power and authority over queer and trans people um, because they ask us to tell stories that center them and not us. So stories like, I've always known I was, right, um, which simplify identity and make it something that we are responsible for knowing about ourselves. Um, you know, um, uh, this really kind of makes identity much more predictable and static. And, and this idea that, you know, we're only one thing and we've always known, and this is the truth, right? Um, that, that this can't change again about us. Um, also the born this way narrative is one of these kind of simplifying compulsory accounts. Like, don't worry about the fact that uh, I'm different because I have no control over it, right? Um, it's not about choice or about desire. It's, it's I have to be this way and so you should accept it or you should feel comfortable accepting me. Uh, I'm still the same person that you've always known, right? I'm just this, there's just this small thing that you didn't know about me. Um, this creates constancy for straight and cis people 
so that they can feel um, more reassured that no dramatic changes are actually happening or necessary. Um, I'm just like you, right? Um, this one uh, really does try to reassure uh, straight and cis people that we are normal or want to be normal um, and that our difference isn't that important and can be overlooked or ignored. And then there's, I want to live just like you, right? And so we can see this account um, really attached to the idea of marriage equality, right? That, that straight and cis people shouldn't be too worried about LGBTQ people because we really just want all the same things they have. And our main goal in life is to just get those things and then we'll be happy and free and no one will have to change the way they're living or thinking about sex and gender at all, right? So you can see how these compulsory accounts really do narrow the frame in which LGBTQ stories can be told. And you might start thinking a little bit more critically about the types of LGBTQ representation you've been exposed to in, in the media and how often they actually practice or reproduce these compulsory accounts that are about wedging LGBTQ people into a world populated by cis and straight stories where those stories don't have to change. LGBTQ people are just conforming to um, those stories that are already set up to be told. So if we could say that the majority of LGBTQ representation that we see in popular culture is these compulsory accounts that are designed to make uh, straight and cis people more comfortable, um, then we could also say maybe there are stories that depart from those compulsory accounts, and we could call those queer, meaning non-normative. So what makes a story queer versus straight or cisgender? Because the dominant ways of organizing a life uh, in our culture do not always reflect our needs or desires, queer and trans people really do have to find other ways of telling stories. Um, and so, but these stories are gonna be less familiar. They're gonna be more confusing. They're gonna depart from that normative narrative structure that we're used to. Um, and so they become less easy to access and engage with. So those kinds of stories, queer stories, might be stories that engage in a number of different kinds of strategies for departing from normative and standard narrative structure. Like, they might resist dominant narrative patterns, like the coming of age story, or the hero tale, um, or um, that cycle of birth, uh, birth, marriage, reproduction, death that we just talked about, right? The happy ending. These things might be missing or rearranged to give us a different kind of story. Uh, two, queer stories might insist on the complexity and provisionality of identity rather than the truth and fixity of it, um, right? Uh, for example, when we get into Gaylord Phoenix, this is a story not just about being gay or just about being trans, it's a story about being both at once. Um, that's really complex experience that we don't really see in dominant culture very much, where dominant culture really only has space for like identities that are these like kind of discrete singular types of experience that are separated from one another what but identities are much more complex than that we ha we all have more than one right um so a queer story might make room for that it might also make room for provisionality and what i mean by that is the changeability of identity right that like all identities are partial and they represent one facet of us but there's always a lot more that could be going on behind that facet that we might not see that might come into a story later on that might become revealed later in life, right? Um, we don't always know who we are and we don't always have control over who we are. And so a queer story might actually make space to tell a story like that. Um, a queer story might refuse to comply with these compulsory accounts of LGBTQ difference. Like, what if I didn't always know who I was? Why should that matter? Why should I have to have known for my identity to be valid? Um, you know, uh, what if I don't want to live like a straight person? What if I want a different kind of life? What if I'm looking for ways to make a life off the grid of this, you know, normative narrative pattern that I'm pushed into? by all the institutions in our culture. Um, what does it look like to say no to that stuff and maybe try to live a different way, right? These are some, some things that a queer story might seek to make um, perceivable or relatable. 
um, here's the thing, right? And I'm, I'm assuming you might be experiencing this looking at fake's work, but um, a queer story might use unconventional or unfamiliar formal or aesthetic approaches. Uh, so we talked about um, the medical gaze and the beautiful, which are both normative approaches to representing bodies, right? But then we talked about the sublime as a way of kind of trying to formally represent a non-normative experience. Um, and, you know, we might look to more experimental or fantastical forms of, of, um, of art to get at non-normative experiences, experiences that, that depart from these more kind of planned out life stories where we know what's coming. What if we don't? How do we, how do we communicate the feeling of that? Um, and uh, we talked about this a bit with the picture of Danny uh, titled, Why Are You Always Looking at My Short Arms? Right? A queer story might make the unjust conditions of having to explain ourselves more obvious. So why should I always have to tell a story? Why should I always be expected to come out? Why should I always have to justify my identity? It gets exhausting. Um, right? So how might a queer story be one that tells us that's kind of refusing to be clear precisely because queer people always have to tell a story that in which we explain ourselves. What if we didn't do that? What if we just made like culture or art that felt true to us and we weren't worried about the audience always having to translate ourselves? What would that look like? And uh, queer stories might make the viewer or reader more responsible for their own assumptions or privileges. Um, they, we might not self-edit so much. We might be more true to our own experience and less worried about um, the viewer, always worrying about being watched, right? I, th I think about Danny in that photo, Why You Are Always Looking at My Short Arms, where she looks right at us and we are then confronted with our gaze right our that we are looking at her she looks right back she doesn't try to make us comfortable um and so how does that point to privileges between able-bodied and disabled people or lgbtq people and straight and cis people right how does this story make the viewer accountable rather than having to do all the work of translation and simplification for the viewer so in this unit, we're going to be looking at some modes of storytelling that are engaging in some of these strategies for moving off of that straight line and straight story and telling a different kind of story about queer life that doesn't engage in these compulsory accounts and instead is more interested in experimentation, fantasy, um, you know, direct queer experience rather than, than um, boxed up, normalized queer experiences. So. Let's talk a little bit about Edie Fake. Who is he? Um, and also, why did I assign this book? Um, I'm assuming that when you looked at this book, you felt a little bit like the Gaylord in this picture, uh, maybe going into a void or experiencing confusion, right? And it, this image actually makes me think a lot about children's stories about going to other confusing worlds uh, like Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz, like going into a fantasy space where the world is familiar but scrambled. And how does that provide us with a space in which to um, engage in new kinds of meaning making? I mean, one reason why I assigned this book is because I think it's a great piece of work. Another reason why I assigned it is because I want to see what you do with it. You know, we've been working all semester together with these concepts and ideas, and um, it's really important once we've looked at a concept like the, the transgender or queer sublime to give you a piece of, of art or work that isn't immediately one thing or another, right? And let's just see what your reactions are. Um, what can you do with it? What pops for you? What comes up for you? Um, you know, we're moving toward more interpretive work in the course at this point. We're looking at more creative kinds of expressions. So um, I really wanted you to have like an out of the box experience just to see uh, what happens for you in that space. I think otherwise this wouldn't be really a queer studies class if we didn't have a really queer experience, meaning an experience we don't know what to do with, a non-normative, weird um, experience, right? Um, 
So that's kind of why I put it in front of you. And I'm really curious to see what you think of it. Um, in terms of the author, uh, Edie Fake is a queer and transgender visual artist, and their work really is interested in fantasy spaces, in pattern, right? Geometric pattern and patterns and bodies and patterns, um, and also the use of abstraction or the simplification of images to explore queer and trans embodiment, which we've talked about quite a bit in this class, but also experience. Experience meaning the kinds of um, narrative environments we find ourselves in. Um, and so I wanted to show you this video uh, of fake because I think getting to know an artist can help us kind of patch together more about what they are doing with their work uh, in terms of their intent for the, for the viewer. My name is Edie Fake, and I'm an artist and cartoonist, and I also work at a bookshop, Quimby's Books. I feel like I've been making art and comics since I was a kid. My mom had like a bag of rags that I really loved, where it was like all fabric scraps and rags, and that was really like influential, where I was just like, oh, all of the pattern together right now. Gaylord Phoenix is this comic I've drawn for a, a long time about a gay bird man and his travels. It's sort of a freewheeling story where he goes through different realms. And I'm using the pronoun he, but it's like more of a they. As I was working on that series by Cook or by Kirk, it was sort of like, kind of brought me around to coming into my own bodily acceptance, I guess. And like, who I was physically and how I moved through space. I think I really worked some things out through the story of Gaylord Phoenix. There's this this image of him like stabbing his own leg. I drew that while I was like learning how to take testosterone by like shooting it in my leg, um, which I don't take anymore, but I'm like, I feel all this conflict in that drawing and here it is like <laughs> being enacted like every two weeks in my own life. My name's Shannon Michael Kane. I work at Printer Matter. We're the world's largest non-profit organization that specializes in artist books. So we order a lot of books from the artists themselves and independent publishers from all around the world. One being Edie, who's been selling books at Printer Matter for over 10 years. But I guess more than anything, the thing that I say caught my eye the first time is still my favorite work, which is the strap on Vikings. I think it's really clever and funny and you know, it's, has that slight hint of gender and, you know, queerness about it. I've started drawing myself in the comics a lot, and I think that was actually a response to one of the questions I'd get asked about Gaylord is like, are you the Gaylord Phoenix? Are you this other, like, the lower Phoenix? People would constantly want to put me in that story, and I'm not a character in that story. I don't get my own kicks by being like, look, it's me naked, but like, it's a lot about my body, and it's a lot about like, um, a trans body in, in sexual space. The transness of my body can get overlooked a lot. Like I don't pass as male. There's not that much female about me either. Like it's, it's, but I think people don't, I don't know if I know how to talk about it and I don't know if a lot of people do, but I feel like that's what I am. And then like putting that into the, the comics in a very direct way makes it almost unavoidable to think about bodies in that kind of way, in the way that my body is. I'm Thomas Robertello, and I own the Thomas Robertello Gallery here in Chicago. I think how I initially became aware of Edie's work was that I read a review. The review interested me enough that I went to see the show. The work that I saw there were you know, highly patterned drawings of these sort of flattened out facades of buildings that um, each had very distinct personalities. And there was a kind of playfulness, there was, there was a dark 
element to it. There's something that I found interesting in the perspective, very unique in, in terms of the flatness, but then how the work had a kind of pulsation. As I came to know Edie, the work started to reveal an even you know, deeper meaning to me that was more specific to the history of Chicago and architectural spaces that he found interesting. Queer and feminist spaces that have existed in Chicago's history that don't anymore, and um, reimagining a facade for them, like giving them a new architecture. The City of Night drawings kind of came about after I crash landed back in Chicago a few years ago. And like in the back of my head being like, I'm back in Chicago, maybe I should open a gay bar. <laughs> like ultimately I don't have my shit together enough to do that yet. But wanting to start queer space and participate in it in like a physical way. I got serious about it when I started working at Quimby's and we used to carry this gay magazine that came out in I think the 70s and 80s in Chicago called Clothes Dick, like the international magazine of clothed men. And uh, they had a bunch of ads for old gay bars in the back, you know, just like old smut rags do. You. And there was one called the Virgo Out. I myself am a Virgo and I was very much like, Virgo Out, what does that even look like? What does that look like? That's such a good name. Pretty much immediately I was like, it's not still there, is it? And I biked buy it and it's kind of like it's nothing fancy looking right now and it's not the Virgo out I think it's a sushi restaurant where it used to be like just a very like plain exterior and I was like no 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 <laughs> I know what the Virgo out looks like and it looks like something it just kind of like kept spilling forward from there, like following through on a lot of like old bar ads. Sometimes the research pushes me to know more about the space and sometimes it just inspires me to like make a space for, for a name. Just learning about queer clubs that happened like in the 20s and 30s in the Vice District and in Bronzeville. There used to be annual drag balls called Finney's Balls here. That was really exciting to me. It, it's been like kind of amazingly eye-opening to look at it through physical space. I want it to be something that envisions like a floating potential for queer space rather than, oh, we'll never have a bar like the Virgo out again, or like, we'll never have this space again. It's lost. It's it's not about that at all. It's a celebration of like a, fan, a fantastic space that has happened and could be the basis for something even more fantastic to happen in the present. Okay, so that gives you a sense of the range of Fake's work um, and really his interest in thinking about spaces as bodies and bodies as spaces and the way in which we, you know, relate the history of bodies and the history of spaces through pattern and narrative, right? Um, where he's like looking to bring these s spaces that have been kind of lost back to life. Um, but also exploring the meaning of his own body and space through illustration. Um, and so in Gaylord Phoenix, uh, Fake is really exploring some deep themes about queer experience, like coming out, medical transition, queer and trans desire and sexuality, um, but also sort of the, some of the darker um, aspects of queer and trans experience, like self-hatred, um, shame, uh, rage, right? Uh, Self-destructiveness, destruct destruction of the lover, of the other, um, because there's not a lot of space in our culture for those feelings to actually get expressed. If you think about those dominant narratives, and then you think about the compulsory accounts of queer life, they have to be super positive and cheery. They have to be about like coming out and being proud and being productive and like waving your little flag, right? And what about all the like dark stuff? What about all the dark feelings that don't really go away? Um, where do, what do you do with those and how do you process them? And I think Gaylord Phoenix is a book about that. It's about the harder things that we aren't allowed to express. And Fake even says in that interview, he said like, I don't even know how to talk about these things. So so we can't tell a story about them in, in maybe in our daily lives, so we need art to do it for us, or maybe, maybe Fake is making art so that we can feel these things. So, um, you know, we think about medical transition and how it's represented in this, uh, this book, um, 
uh, Fake mentions this picture of, of the stabbing of the leg as a kind of analog for um, the injection of testosterone and also all the stuff that's coming out of his body, right? This like gooey, geometric, organic thing that's coming out in some ways is about dysphoria or sort of like, like feeling bad about gender and, and how trans people carry that inside us, but also all of the, the gook inside of us that we can't express. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, um, the phoenix in the title of this book is actually used on purpose because the phoenix, right, is this creature that, that burns and dies and then regenerates over and over again, right? So Fake is using this mythical figure to explore like the many versions of self that queer and trans people have to navigate, right? That we that we have many selves that we're moving through, um, and that we have to we have to reintegrate them somehow through telling stories about ourselves, um, in order to survive, right? So, fake is exploring the experience of of like, how do we start to know that we have a body, uh, and then how do we start to actually talk about our bodies, and then you know for queer and trans people there's a moment in our lives where we realize that the body is insufficient, language is insufficient, we have to transform them somehow, we have to find a way to tell a different story, we have to find our way to a different body to be who we are. Um, and so when you think about the way in which that's represented in this book, like what rebuilds your world, when your world falls apart <laughs> because the world is not prepared or set up for queer and trans people to be in, right? All the structures tell us we don't exist. So what happens when you show up anyway and none of the systems work for you? The world can feel like it's crashing down. Um, and so how does the world get rebuilt? He says, at first, small things, right? Uh, this story is a, is a very meticulous thinking through of, of the uh, sort of existential experience of, of queerness or transness as uh, a set of moments. So, um, I have a prompt up for you about like responding to this piece on your own. I thought I would just talk about what I love about it um, and walk you through some of my favorite pages. I absolutely love every page of this of this book, um, but I would talk about some key things in the book that I find really meaningful. I also love that as you move through it, we go from very kind of primitive illustration, so this looks very much, this is early in the book, it looks very much like a child's illustration, to much more accomplished sort of virtuosic uh, uh, illustration later in the book. And, and it, you know, I don't know to what extent that's intentional or to what extent Fake is actually perfecting his craft as he's making the book, um, but it definitely tells a story of maturation, right? So I love this early series about, uh, of, of pages about the crystal claw. So it says, exploring the secret grotto poised in shadow, right? So here's Gaylor Phoenix. He's moving through this secret grotto I think of the grotto as a kind of space of, of unconsciousness or just you're just coming into consciousness. It's a dark place. Um, you're not quite in the world yet. You're maybe you're just a baby. Um, and somewhere in that space is this claw, right? This like source of violence and wounding. Um, and and the, the Gaylor doesn't see it yet, but what, what's gonna happen, right, is that the claw is going to pierce him in the thigh. And um, I think about this as the experience as a kid, a queer, little queer kid, maybe, or trans kid of, you know, early in life, probably, you start to get the feeling that something's not right. Something is wrong with you. And it, it's not, and it's, it, it's not the world anymore, like you're wrong. And something has come into you and sent that message to you that like, your body's wrong, you're wrong, you want the wrong things, you are different. And so I think about this representation of Crystal Claw deep in the night as like that original experience of realizing something is wrong, right? Um, that you're bad or that you're flawed. And throughout this book, the Gaylord always has the scar from this moment, right, on his leg. It's the same place where he will later um, stick the knife. Um, to try to maybe reopen this wound and explore what has happened here at the site of this of this violence 
um, that the world has done to him. And so right after this experience, he sinks into the ground, he falls into a hole, and he's like clearly very panicked. And then that's when the cone appears on his face and he starts to be able to speak. So you could think about the cone as here, the acquisition of language, right? Like we learn to talk and until we learn to talk, we can't really express our identities or ourselves or our desires at all. And what is the first thing he says when he acquires language is help right so from the very beginning um his first kind of cry is like i know something is wrong and i need help and he goes through this book looking for help and he finally realizes that he has to do it himself right like no one can give him what he needs um and so later in the book i love this panel or two pages right um, I already talked about the image on the left, which Fake says was meant to represent, in some ways, um, hormonal transition, right? Where all of this kind of bad, what looks like kind of bad, maybe mix of, of like chaotic things coming out of the same like wound in his leg. Um, his face looks like maybe he's in a little bit of pain. Um, but there are all these shapes inside him, right? Like uh, we could think about how the shape of the body for trans people is is not matching the inner shape of the gender the person feels they are and so here we have a mismatch between outside shape and inside shape and that wound from the crystal claw is the exact place where then the knife goes that then lets this shape out and in the next page the shape has now expanded and starts to become clouds and flowers and paisleys and it says this realm rolls back and after this moment, the Gaylord goes to a different entire world called the Trash Age, which is all um, has this pink color, right? Um, so we could think about how medical transition here, a lot of people think of it as just a physical process, but for the person undergoing it, it is an incredibly transformative interior process as well, where one's senses totally shift and change. Um, and that can often be one of the more intense experiences of transition isn't necessarily the physical changes, but the psychological and cognitive ones. Um, and so how is it almost like going to another world? Remember the original world had the crystal claw. This new world might be a place where that claw, the wound could be healed eventually. And then um, I'll talk a bit about, I love this in the third section, um, uh, these are sort of two of Gaylord selves talking to one another, and one tells the other, it is like this, always others' eyes, right? And again, it's a reminder that no matter what we do, because we are LGBTQ people kind of caught in a straight and cisgender world, that we're always going to be subject to the gaze of other people. We're always going to be looked at. We're always going to be judged. We're always going to be watched, right? And... Um, it's something that we have to contend with. It's something that we have to not allow ourselves to be con completely controlled by the stories other people will tell about us. And um, I kind of love that right after this, you know, there's this moment of a uh, kind of truth telling here where the eyes are covered because it's always someone else looking at you. What you see about yourself doesn't matter maybe all the time. It's more what other people see that is gonna matter but then the next page says open wide um, and we see kind of we get to see inside uh, Phoenix's body so we get to see even though we're caught in a world where what other people see about us is going to define the story that they tell that doesn't necessarily um, exhaust the massive possibilities we have inside of us to, to, to tell other things stories to make other kinds of meaning and so even though um you know phoenix is still has the hands over his eyes we get to see this interior universe that's going on inside of him all the time and you could read this as open wide you could also read it as wide open right you could read it either way as a kind of palindrome kind of concept palindromic concept where um we could say open wide to the world. We could also say that we want to try to stay wide open to experience and not be shut down by the stories the world tells about us because they don't exhaust the possibilities that we contain. Um, so 
all of this is to say I'm trying to prep you for looking at work that's more that asks us to do more interpretive labor to kind of make sense of what we're looking at or what we're seeing. We're going to be looking at um, some, uh, we've already looked at performance art with, with Sins and Valid. Now we're looking at illustration. We're going to look at poetry. Um, and we're also going to look at memoir and um, uh, sort of like, uh, like video performance art, video vlogging uh, practice also. Um, and in this unit, we're going to be thinking about like, why would queer and trans people make these kinds of things? What are they responding to? What are they hoping to demonstrate? Um, and how do those stories move off of that dominant account or that compulsory account to make space for other kinds of experience? Um, so if it's confusing, it's actually meant to be, right? Because being queer or trans in a straight cis world is confusing. And um, sometimes confusion can be really rich and productive because it allows for other kinds of possibilities to come to come into perception. Um, we I would hate it for queerness to just always mean the same thing. That's not the point of a queer life, I would say. Um, so I'll be really curious to see how you respond to this work. Uh, I'm sorry we haven't had a, a chance to talk about it in person, um, but I'm going to have you navigate over to discussions to respond to this video with some more thinking about your own um, kind of reactions to this, to this book and what you are finding in it. Okay, so that's just to start on our unit, Stories, and um, I will look for you over on Blackboard. Hope you're all doing okay. Bye.